All right, 37-31, the final score here from New Orleans. Texas comes up just short on the final play of the game to Washington here with Eric Henry, Jeff Howard, and Chip Brown. Fellas, what a game, first of all, from start to finish if you're a college football fan. But for Texas specifically, just an absolutely gut-wrenching finish. They fought to get there in the end and just come up, I think, 12 yards short. Chip, that final sequence, you know, what did you see and what could the Longhorns have done better? not just in that last sequence, but really in this game, to set themselves up better. Well, I think you're gonna look back if you're Steve Sarkeesian and the Texas Longhorns, and you're gonna say, man, we ran the ball so well in this game, and we didn't make it work to our benefit. And especially on a night when Michael Penix is in the zone. I mean, he is just lighting you up with one deep ball after another, just dropping it in buckets. Texas averaged 6.7 yards per carry on first down, 17 first down runs for 114 yards. It wasn't, I mean, they were consistently running the football in the, especially in the first half when Quinn Ewers was struggling. I mean, Quinn Ewers opened one of five passing and he was at 1.42% passing in the first half and Texas is averaging you know, over six yards on carry. And even at the end of the game, guys, C.J. Baxter, Jaden Blue, and Quinn Ewers averaged over six yards per carry, but they didn't stick with it. And so by the time they get to the fourth quarter after a disastrous third quarter when they only possess the ball for, you know, two minutes, they, they're having to throw it all over the place. And it was a heroic effort by everybody on that field just to get it to where they had a chance to, you know, have a couple throws into the end zone there in the final seconds. Michael Penix was the absolute story of this game for Washington. Uh, I think, fellas, safe to say the best game of his life uh, by far. Just there's no other way to put it, I don't think, than he just carved up the Texas defense. Eric, what does Texas do now in the secondary after a performance like that? Obviously, Michael Penix is just a fantastic quarterback. You're not going to get that kind of play from a quarterback every week, but it is very clear that that unit has issues. It's interesting, Tommy, you mentioned that, right? Because I asked the question I asked Steve Sarkeesian post game. How much of what happened out there tonight was a byproduct of the pass rush not getting home? Because clearly they, they were able to harass him somewhat, but Michael Penix being a veteran guy, a sixth year player, so savvy in the pocket, just always being able to step up and sidestep any pressure. So I think it's twofold, Tommy. One, you know you have help coming in. You have Clemson transfer Andrew Rocky coming in, and then you know you have Xavier Philosami and other guys as far as the secondary coming and being able to, to make plays. But in my mind, you can't put this all on the secondary. I mean, this is a byproduct of, hey, maybe you play this game this time or this time next year, you have Colin Simmons rushing off the edge with Anthony Hill Jr., right? And some of those blitzes get home. So it's like it's a byproduct of a couple things, but listen, let's not take anything away from Michael Penny. We can't underscore just enough what type of performance that was. I mean, just deadly accurate. We saw how many times in this ball game we're short. If your DBs get their head around, maybe they can make a play on the ball, but Michael Penny is dropping the, the passes right in the bucket in the hands of his receivers. So sure, you can look and say, hey, in the off season, you want to, you know, kind of project forward and say, this may be a help, that may be a help, but you know, let's hope that every week you're not playing against a Michael Penix Jr. But with that being said, you obviously will need to go through quarterbacks who are as talented, if not even more talented, to get back to a CFP run and, and, and try to close the job with a national title. Think about this for a second. Penix was 11 of 14 for 255 yards in the first half and Texas was tied. Yeah. I mean, it was, oh, it was, it was there for Texas. It to, really was to close it out. And I think it's fair to say that game probably shouldn't have even been tied no. at halftime. I mean, mm -hmm. they're they're a muff punt away right. from being down one score. Washington comes down with second half, first drive, first touchdown. Texas could have very easily been down two scores to start off that second half. Jeff, my question for you: This loss is going to sting for Longhorn fans for a while. It's going to be a, it's, it's going to feel like a very long off season. If you were to make a list of points of emphasis for this team as you head into spring ball and you head into fall camp, what would be on that list? I think if you're Sark, I think you've got to reinforce 
hey, you got here by by hard work. It started in winter conditioning last year. We know everything that went into it. That this team was determined to be better than an eight and five team that lost a lot of close games in 2022. Chip, you remember this well. The one thing you can't do is you can't have what Mac Brown did after the Alabama loss in January 2010, where you're just kind of sulking and feeling sorry for yourself for nine months, and then oh hey, we got a football season to play, and then you never get it on track. So. It, it, you've got to flip the switch really quick. Uh, Eric hit on it too. I think some of the personnel upgrades you're going to get in the secondary, I think, are really going to help. Look, they, this staff made Xavier Filsimi and Andrew Makuba priorities at safety position for a reason. And, you know, Derek Williams, <laughs> you came and asked me at halftime and said, hey, does Derek Williams make a difference in the game? I said, probably not because Derek Williams doesn't put the corner. <laughs> so, uh, you know, They've got talent at the corner position. I mean, I, I think we all agree, like Malik Muhammad's going to be a really good player by the time right. he leaves here. Uh, just a young guy. You know, Terrence Brooks kind of went through some of the ups and downs you typically see a sophomore go through. Ryan Watts, if this is his last game at Texas, it's probably going to be one he wants to forget. But, uh, you know, I, I thought there were times Washington did a really good job of taking advantage. And this is where – this is the kind of personnel where when Texas, when you, do, you go back to 2005 when they won the national championship and even when they played for it in 2009. I think the big difference with that team and this team, it's not even Colt McCoy because I think offensively this team does things a little bit differently than that team did. It's They don't have, you know, a Shockey Brown, a Curtis Brown, an Aaron Williams. They don't have a, a Lamar Houston. They don't have that guy, a Sergio Kendall. They don't have that, that dynamic pass rusher that can change a game. They don't have that shut down corner that, that can really take away one side of the field like Washington had tonight with Jabbar Muhammad. So, or but, Earl Thomas who was just. Or was ball hawk in the middle of the field. And, and I told Chip this earlier, and I, it's weird that I think this. You know, I've followed, covered this team all year, been in, in, you know, close to it, as close as anybody can be. And it wasn't until we're on that shuttle from the Superdome coming back to the hotel that I thought, you know what, they're, they're a lot closer than I thought because as bad as they played, they still had the ball with 15 seconds left, one play away from going to the national championship yeah. game. So I think it just shows you, one, the job Sark and the staff have done to build this roster. It's really freaking talented. And two, you know, if you clean up some things here and there and, and you're not that many pieces away. I know, Chip, I know in the past we, we tried to convince ourselves that Texas was a couple of pieces away, but it really does feel like – there may be a shutdown corner and or a dynamic pass rusher away from being right back here next year with a chance to, to actually get to the title game. Yeah, and you know, I'll go we'll go across the board one last time here for the season. Texas finishes the year twelve and two. I think you made a good point that there's things to build on, and that's one thing, but the transition of the SEC is a whole other thing. So you kind of build the blocks on one side, but there's a massive obstacle still awaiting on the other. Chip, when you assess this season how do you feel about the Longhorns transition to the SEC and knowing that you're going to a tougher stronger more physical conference what in your opinion is going to be the biggest thing you're looking for come spring practice come fall practice well is Quinn Ewers coming back because what we saw from Michael Penix tonight a sixth year guy in Washington to their credit nine six year guys and they were making plays all over the field, those guys. So, you know, does Quinn Ewers come back? Uh, a lot of Texas's transition to the SEC is gonna be dependent on guys like Alfred Collins and, you know, Trill Carter even um, with Vernon Broughton coming back just to maintain the strength of that defensive line. I thought we saw some good things tonight from Ethan Burke, yeah. who, yeah fought his ass off and almost had a sack and almost had a sack and um, but was making plays and um, you know they're going to lose to Vondere Sweat they're going to lose Byron Murphy um, and Johnny Barron and most likely Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell though that's those are huge playmakers for Texas but they've recruited really well they've got Matthew Golden coming in from Houston you got to have enough holdover guys who can maintain that culture because Guys like Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, who are two of the biggest, baddest dudes on the team, were holding people accountable. That's a dream for a coach when your biggest, baddest dudes are the ones setting the tone and, and holding everyone accountable. Not gonna be easy, but they, you know, they're gonna have enough guys back from this culture to, to uh, you know, be able to build and, um, and possibly reload and, and go at it again next year. Eric, I'll kind of ask you the same question, but in a little bit of a different way. 
What does Texas need to do to make sure that this season isn't a one-hit wonder of sorts? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to piggyback off the end of Chip's answer. I'm going to go right to something that Jordan Whittington told me. You know, it was a few days ago when Texas arrived for this game, and he said something that really made my ears perk up, guys. He said that, you know, hey, it's really unique to have the young guys truly hone in and listen to the message that the veterans are, are giving, that they weren't taking this moment for granted. Obviously, it didn't work out on the scoreboard tonight, but to me, that's key when you talk about keeping that culture, right? The fact that the young guys are understanding, hey, while uh, a Jonte Cook or an Anthony Hill, they may not have been part of the you know five and seven and some of the previous Texas disappointments, they can hone in on that. They can internalize that and understand like now they have their own disappointment, understanding how close they were to a national championship. To me, it's these young guys taking the baton, moving it forward, keeping that culture going. That to me is something that I think I mean, you can, it, to use the old, you know, the Breeze Hall line, right? Five-star talent versus five-star culture, but now Texas has both, right? So keeping that five-star culture in tow and transitioning that through, to me, I think that's a huge thing, especially when you lose guys like John A. Barron, Devondre Sweat, Byron Murphy, and others. It's these young guys who have been through the war, battle-tested. Can, can they take the baton and keep them moving forward? To me, that's, that's just as key as anything in my mind. And Jeff, final question for you. When we get 10 years down the line and think about this Texas team, what's going to be the one thing that you remember the most? Probably the way they ended the regular season. Uh, and really the, knowing the challenge and the pressure of, hey, it's your last year in the Big 12. You're the preseason have picked to win the league. Can you go do it? And, and we haven't seen Texas do that since 09. To have that pressure in the preseason and be able to get the job done, uh, you know, to, to be able to rally from the Oklahoma. And you think about it, the Oklahoma loss, you think about everything this team went through, right? You know, when, when they lose Quinn Ewers, they won two conference games, including K-State in overtime with Malik Murphy. They lose Jonathan Brooks, and yet they still find ways to run the football. And the way they beat Texas Tech at home in the regular season and then obliterated Oklahoma State in the Big 12 championship game, I think probably ended ended their time in the league. I think the way a lot of Texas fans at one point probably thought the vast majority of Texas' years would go in the Big 12. So I think it's just leaving the league on a high note. Uh, and the fact that I think that this – Going back to what you asked Eric, and Eric, what you said, and Chip, what you, what you said, this is, this needs to be the start of a new era of Texas football. You know, too many too many times we've thought we've been here, right? We've seen, you know, Chip, we were here five years ago and thought we saw maybe one of the next golden eras of Texas football. That wasn't meant to be, but I think to, to Eric's point about talking about the culture, uh, I think football needs to take a note from Texas baseball, right? Like, how many times have we seen that with Texas baseball? Like, there's usually a young group of guys that they'll pay their own way to go to Omaha, but they're around the culture, they see what it's like, and they know what it takes to get the job done to get back there. So hopefully we see some of that start taking place with the football program. When things have been really good around here, that's how it got so good. It was Casey Hampton and Sean Rogers and Aaron Humphrey. They passed it on to Chris Sims and, and Rod Babers and Corey Redding and Bo Scaife, who passed it on to, to Michael Huff and Cedric Griffin uh, and, and, and Brian Robinson and Tim Crowder, who passed it on to, to the Sam Achos and the Earl Thomases of the world, at some point that thing became broken. But if it starts again now with Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy and Jordan Whittington passing on down to uh, a, a roster that's really freaking talented, then yeah, Texas can go into the SEC and, and compete in that league right away. I don't see no reason why they can't. Well, it's going to be a couple months, but we will find out. But for now, year three of the Steve Sarkeesian era ends with a 12-2 and two record coming up just short in the Sugar Bowl. It's going to do it for us here from New Orleans. Thank you so much for watching here on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel. And thanks for being with us throughout the entire season. Really appreciate it. While you're here, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn post notifications on so you're the first to know when new content is here. The season's over, but our content's not. So make sure you stick around for the rest of the guys. Chip Brown, Jeff Howe, Eric Henry, I'm Tommy Yars. Thanks for being with us all season. We appreciate it so much. And stick around at Horns247.com.